Welcome back, everybody. My name is Brandon Dukeman here with Will Harvey, and today is Multifamily Monday. Thanks for joining us. And before we get started with Multifamily Monday, don't forget to subscribe to the show so that you don't miss any of our Multifamily Mondays or any of our daily episodes, and to rate and comment on the video on the episodes so we know how we're doing. And also join us on Facebook at facebook.com slash groups slash wealth junkies. Well, let's get started with Multifamily Monday. Thank you, Brandon. Today we have Jeff Greenberg on the podcast and uh, he is a multifamily investor since 2007. So he's been doing it a while and he also has a background in IT. So I'll let him dive deeper into that. With, with that, Jeff, we, we appreciate you coming on the show. Can you just give the listeners a little bit more about your story and how you got to where you are today? Well, thank you very much for having me. Absolutely. Um, this is always fun to talk about real estate. I spend a lot of time doing that. Um, I've been doing multifamily investing since about 2007. I've uh, actually started out trying to do some single family um, REOs, uh, but that wasn't a great time. Um, actually, in 2005, I was starting to do the single family stuff but uh, prices were going down so fast, you couldn't really uh, figure out what your purchase price was and what your after repaired value was. So mm -hmm. the single family home route just didn't seem to be working for me at that period in time. So I uh, got into multifamily. Uh, we actually bought our first um, syndicated property in about 2010 and have been buying multifamily properties since then um, got into student housing probably about uh, four years ago and then retired from my day job about two and a half uh, almost almost three years now well, and congratulations uh, doing it doing it full time Very cool. love it so what it was it, yeah Brandon. it was the retirement uh, I mean after a certain amount of years was it a scheduled retirement or was it that you were you were doing so well in multifamily business that the retirement came early for you. Well, it was it was kind of I was able to do it, mm -hmm. and um, I had the day I walked into work, I had no plans on retiring. Um, but I <laughs> That's just, cool. it, it, I mean, I wouldn't have, if somebody would have asked me that morning, and I would wouldn't have said no. Nah, I had no plans to do that. Right. But we had just gotten through our our annual reviews, or we were doing our annual reviews. I got a great review, and then my boss uh, told me that. He had this new project for me, and I was going to be le leading this project, and I kind of sat back and thought about it that I said, you know what? No, I, I, my, all my brain cells are focused on real estate. I didn't want to have to focus on anything new and to organize and to, to uh, supervise a group of people to implement this new project. And I looked at him and I said, Dave, no. I'm giving you 60 days notice. Wow. I mean, it was right on the spot within a couple minutes of my thinking about it. I just said, no, but it was a great feeling. That's awesome. It was, it was just a great feeling to be able to do that. That's a rare, he, that's a rare one. Yeah. I mean, he just kind of looked at me and smiled and he said, I wondered when the day was going to come <laughs> because he knew I was doing real estate. Right. Right. In fact, I had helped yeah. him and done some advising on some uh, real estate stuff he had done. Um, and he said, well, if things keep going the way they are, uh, I may be working for you. So uh, that's a little role reversal there. That's awesome. Yeah. So I gave him notice and that was the end of it. And I'm still friends with him. I still go to lunch with him and a bunch of other guys from my work, but, um, that was that's it. cool. So you didn't have that, you know, where you burn a bridge type of situation where you just hate your job and plan it out, go in there one day and quit and yell at your boss or whatever it wasn't like that it was just it was just hey you know i'm, I'm just kind of done yeah it wasn't that i hated my job that it's it's just that in the anybody in the it business knows that there's always new things you have to learn mm -hmm. there's always you know you're always learning a new product or you're learning something new absolutely you know and i didn't i wasn't interested in wasting my brain cells learning new it stuff um, I spent my time listening to real estate podcasts, to re reading real estate books. Uh, it was all my energy was focused in on real estate. And I 
you know, I, I worked with a couple other guys. They love doing that kind of stuff. They loved finding the new IT stuff. They loved learning something new and figuring out how to get it to work and mm -hmm. the whole bit. And I would tell them, I said, look, you guys figure it all out. You get it working and then tell me what I got to do to administer it. Because that's the part they hated. Yeah. They hated that stuff. That was boring. But to me, that was great. I would administer it. I would operate it. And I could save my brain cells for learning more real estate. And so they're still working and I've left the business. Uh, nice. And that kind of goes to the, the point where find where you add value to something, you know, you don't enjoy doing that one thing and, but there's somebody else that enjoys, you know, figuring it out. You, you team up with somebody who's got the value of, you know, one side that you hate doing the, the learning, but like doing the administering and they hate the administering and they do the learning. So I think that good team. Yeah, a good That's a good on. team. That's, yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Uh, tell us about how did you get into it in the first place? What was, what was your career progression from, from when you either graduated college or high school? That's, that's kind of interesting. I don't think I've had that question uh, brought up. Um, I used to, I was working at a private school um, a long time ago, and that's when uh, um, the, well, I guess the apples were first coming out. Um, and I got real interested in the Apple Mac Plus, if, if you guys are old enough to even know what that is. Um, that came out in 1984. Yeah, definitely um, not old enough. Yeah. And, <laughs> we weren't around. <laughs> right, and, and I got the opportunity to learn on that and got real excited about uh, computers at that time. And eventually, in this private school, worked my way into where I was actually working in a computer lab and teaching the kids. And so I actually had two labs. One was a Mac lab um, with the, the, the newest Max, which was a Mac LC, which was okay. the first, first color Mac. Hmm. And then we also had some uh, Windows machines that were wi running uh, Windows 3.1, if, if you know the history of, of Windows, and ended up being uh, in charge of the IT at that school. And then later, I mean, at, I was training teachers I was training kids, I was training administer, administrators. Um, and then I left the school business and came into an IT, uh, a technology company. I went into Zebra Technology that uh, they, they make printers and scanners and those kind of things and worked directly for their IT department. Sure. So that was kind of my transition into the IT business. Got it. Oh, and then, how did you stumble? Did you stumble across real estate? Did someone get you into it? Did you know? Did you read a book? Watch a movie? Did you read a little purple book called uh, "Rich Dad Poor Dad." <laughs> well, that was that was in there. Um, it was actually a buddy of mine and I uh, were on a hike, and he mentioned that he was going to start getting involved in uh, real estate investing. And at that time, the only thing I thought about real estate investing was, okay, you buy a house you rent it out and that's it. You know, it was a buy and hold strategy, you rent it out. I didn't know about anything else, mm -hmm. any other strategies. And so we started uh, exploring some uh, seminars and listening to things on short sales and REOs and um, a lot of that stuff. And so, and, and at that time also I did uh, read um, Rich Dad Poor Dad and totally turned me around because you know just as rich dad had uh it was um i was raised you know uh go to school you know go to college get a job you know and then retire from your job with your pension or whatever yep. you know exactly as he talks about in the book and never did i think i was going to be an entrepreneur i always thought my whole life i was going to be a w-2 employee and that was the only thought i had um, my brother was more of an entrepreneur and um, I watched his successes and failures, but I had a family and to me, it was much safer to be a W-2 employee, which now I, I don't feel that safe. Mm -hmm. I don't feel being a W-2 employee is safe for your family. But at that time, that was my thought, um, but that started to change. And when I discovered multifamily properties, uh, I started looking into that. And re I was also going through a divorce at that time. So I was looking at my retirement money, which I lost my, 
my house to my, my ex and had a limited amount of money and syndication seemed to be the answer to my prayers because I could go in with a limited amount of money and leverage other people's money by providing a service, the service that we do provide and help um, other people with money get involved in, Absolutely. in, in the deals. And that's, that I feel is the, the service we provide and able to make uh, some good money doing that. Yeah, you're, you're right about that. You are kind of providing a service, at least, you know, for your investors, for individuals who are living in your apartments that you own. And so that's, that's a good word to, a good way to describe it, providing a service. Uh, you mentioned in 2014, you got into student housing. Is that correct? Uh, yeah, that's about right. So kind of talk to us about what student housing is specifically and and why it's attractive to you and, and kind of how those are different from a normal apartment syndication. Mm -hmm. um, the student housing, obviously we're focused on college students. Um, the difference is sometimes you're renting by the bed, sometimes you're renting by the unit. Um, the The main things that you have to be concerned about is focusing on the uh, lease up window. Um, you miss a lease up window, and that's different at each different universities. And sometimes it's different at each different on different properties and property sizes. Um, but you miss that lease up window. There's a chance that you may not get any renters in there for the semester or maybe even the year. So you have to be concerned about that. Um, your your lease up marketing is typically totally different, and that's why you need a property management company that specializes in in student housing uh, because you're not just putting your stuff on apartments.com and and uh, craigslist you have to get on the campus you have to get to the sororities and fraternities and and um, sometimes they'll have lease up uh, fairs where you'll have a table uh, on the campus and um, where you have somebody sitting there handing out swag items, you know, gift items right. uh, to the students, or you'll have an open house on your property or a lot more work than typically your property management company is prepared to do. There's also a lot of online presence. You want to have a Facebook page. You want to have people active um, on different social media, you know, talking about your property, throwing videos out there just a whole different marketing right. thing. Yeah. You got to play to your, your customers. Essentially you're, you're dealing with, you know, right. 18 to 21 year olds essentially. And it's mm -hmm. a little different than dealing with, you know, 30, 35 year olds looking mm -hmm. for apartments. And, and a lot of times um, some of my properties were also doing uh, roommate matching where we try to get people in the rooms that are compatible that aren't going to, you know, tear each other apart because one wants to go to sleep early and the ones, other one wants to party all night. Right. Um, so there's a lot of different things that are specialized for the property management company. And it, that's, that's critical that you get a good property management company. That's right. They, you know, they say that you make your money when you buy. I really think you make your money. Um, I think that's true. You got to buy the property right. But operations is really where that makes or breaks um, whether you make money or, or, or don't, you know, having that good property management company that's, that's active in, in, in whatever area you're in, whatever college you're in. That's so, that's so important. Um, I want to, I want to come back to the whole student housing thing, talk about some of the deals that you're doing. But first I want to talk about, um, just your first real estate deal in general, and then just how you did your first multifamily deal. Can you kind of elaborate on those? Well, those are one and the same. My first, oh, okay. real, my first real estate deal, other than my my own personal residence, was a syndicated deal. Oh, um, nice. We jumped right into it, skipped over everything else. Uh, you're that you're was, one of the few guys that have, have <laughs> skipped the whole uh, yes. fix and flip and all the single family nonsense. Yeah, yeah we, we skipped right over there. I think my partner did have a single family home, uh, my partner back then. Um, but we jumped right into a 20 unit property. It was actually five fourplexes. They were all okay. four bedroom, two bath or two and a half bath, um, all in the same cul-de-sac. And we bought five of them. And so we just called it a 20 unit apartment. 
I mean, or that's how we treated it and mm-hmm. operated it as such. But that was a syndicated deal. We, we raised money for that. Um, I don't know that I recommend doing that because there was so little money left over right. uh, for us that we, we barely made anything. We, you know, it certainly wasn't worth it financially for us. Um, the education was great. Uh, the experience was, was good with the investors. We still have some of those still with us. Um, but financially it wasn't, uh, it wasn't anything spectacular for us. Did, uh, did, did the investors, did they all make money? Oh yeah, they made money and awesome. they made, they made better than they would do in the bank, but the, you know, it wasn't what we had hoped for. Uh, okay. the property, the property was only three years old when we bought it. Mm. It was three years old. It was a hundred percent occupied. Um, and so there wasn't a lot of value add. Yeah. We figured we were going to raise rents. Well, we struggled with that, getting the rents raised. It was in a pretty slow growth market. Uh, we started to do some billing back on water. They already paid for their own electric. So we, we, we didn't have that to add, um, that there was a lot of resistance. And so there wasn't a lot of value that we could Mm -hmm. add to it. And that was the big lesson learned there that making sure you have a good value add. Right. Otherwise, when you try to sell it, uh, our big concern when we were trying to sell it was our selling costs were going to eat up any profit that we had made on increasing the value of the property. Oh, wow. So there wasn't, there wasn't a lot in there. So we, we drew a line in the sand and said, okay, this is what we're, this will be the lowest price we will sell it for. We were supposed to sell in five years. We started in year four and a half and sold it in year six, okay. even, ex- even extended the loans in order to get that price that we weren't going to settle. And so we finally got our price uh, in year six. What kind of debt did you put on it? Uh, that was a local bank debt. That was a bank. Okay. Yeah, it was, it was a local bank. It was a very small local bank. Um, they were the ones that actually had the debt originally from the construction. And even though they called it an assumption, um, our terms that we had were totally different than the terms uh, that the developers had. We bought this from the developers. For better or worse? Um, ours were much better. Oh, our, nice. our, 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 terms, our terms were much better. Um, this uh, bank was, wanted to do everything they could to get us the loan. They were squeezing things left and right. They even squeezed one of the sellers to carry a second um, in order because we refused to put more money down. Uh, they, they negotiated with the seller to carry a second with us and even gave us all the documentation and paperwork um, to nice. get that second because they wanted them out. They, were, uh, may, they may, may have been decent developers, but they were lousy owners and the bank just wanted them out. They both... Yeah. There was two different developers. They both owed on their taxes for the last three years. Oh wow! And one of them, one of them refused to come to the table if he had to bring money, because he was going to lose money because of all the taxes he owed. And so my my broker actually kicked in part of his commission just to get this guy to the table, and he broke even on the deal. Wow! Wow! Well, that's why they're called developers and not investors. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah. That's. We have, we have a property that we're a part of that um, it's the same thing. These people did a terrific job developing it, beautiful property. Um, but then they did a horrible, horrible job managing it and operating it. So that's, they kind of ran it into the ground and it created an opportunity for us to come in and yeah, get it. But those so, are the best opportunities. Yeah, to- those are, those are. Well, these guys, these guys got stuck in, stuck with it in 2007 when they finished building. Mm-hmm. It was not a good time for uh, to sell it. And that's where right. they ended up having to hang on for another three years before they were able to sell it. They did not want to be, they did not want to be managing it. Yeah. I was going to say that's, that's usually a fairly long time for a developer to be sitting on some properties like right. that. Usually they're in and out, you know, selling yeah, it. That's to, what they wanted to be. Right. right. They, they didn't want to be sitting on it. Right. Very yeah. So, so back to, uh, back to student housing, can you tell us about an actual live deal that you've done or, or, or working on just some of that? Well, the, the best deal that, that we've done is the one in uh, Georgia where um, we actually bought it out of foreclosure 
Um, it was it was actually a capital fund that had uh, held held the note on it. They foreclosed on on the deal, and so now they were holding it, and their fund wanted to cash out. So we were able to come in and buy it well below um, what it was appraised at a few years prior to that. It was appraised, I think. Um, a few years prior to our buy-in, probably about 2.6, I think 2.6 or 2.8, I can't quite remember. And we came in and bought it at 1.1. That's awesome. Um, wow. That's a steal. Yeah. I mean, it was 30% occupied. It was filled with a bunch of people that weren't, well, it was it was actually 48% occupied, but only 30% were paying. <laughs> right. Um, 30 there was economic. A lot, yeah. There was a lot of drugs going on. There was a lot of... Uh, things going on in the property and um, we were able to come in and get rid of all of that, uh, clean up its reputation, get a relationship with the school, uh, with the community um, and, and get it up to a hundred percent. We actually had the mayor of the city oh, come nice. out. The mayor, we had an open house. The mayor of the city came out actually wearing one of our t-shirts. Um, we did a big uh, online, um, uh, I guess podcast as well as um, you know, kind of a radio thing with a DJ, you know, on the property. Oh, that's awesome. And had a bunch of the uh, people from the university come out and check it out and see what we had done. And then uh, they started to send people to us when their dorms were filled up. Oh, so, nice. That's cool to have that relationship with them. So yeah, well, we, how long did it take you guys to rebuild that reputation for the property? Um, probably, uh, I would say less than a year, wow. mainly because we went and we, we had it, we sat with the mayor, we told her what our plans were. We sat with the school and told them what our plans were. And initially they said, well, we're not going to be sending anybody over to you unless our, you know, our dorms were filled. They were having trouble filling up their dorms. And then it seemed like their dorm renovation pro uh, process went slower than they had planned. And so all of a sudden they got full and all of a sudden we're sending people to us. We also went and saw um, the different coaches. We went to the football coach, basketball coach, track coach, softball, volleyball. We went to all the different coaches and for the most part, they looked at us and like we were crazy. Like, you know, why do we want to send our people over there? Right. And then we told them, come visit, you know, come to our open house, come look at the property, see what we're doing. And we ended up getting a lot of athletes after that. Once they That's cool. realized that we were cleaning things up, we were kicking out people that didn't belong. Mm -hmm. And um, all of a sudden we, we were getting all kinds of athletes uh, in the property and we were filling up with good people. And we also uh, did a sponsorship deal with the athletic department that for, uh, I believe we paid $3,000. For that $3,000, we got a banner. They made the banner for us. We didn't even have to pay for it. They made a banner with our property on it um, that was displayed at, at all, the, uh, all the different home events. But we also did a 60 second video that I actually went and did the videotaping on and my team did the soundtrack and everything where I actually interviewed some of our uh, tenants and they played that 60 second uh, clip on their jumbotron at every home basketball and every home football game. No for, kidding. For That's the awesome. next year. Talk about, talk about cheap advertisement. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. That's awesome. Well, that, that was, that, that, that was cool. awesome. Yeah. So what, what makes, what makes student housing attractive to you? Well, the one, there's two things that I think make it attractive is one, there's a lot of people that mess it up. Okay. We're all looking for value adds. We're all looking for something where somebody messed something up that we can fix up. You know, either they didn't take care right. of the property or it's lousy management or whatever it happens to be. Well, it seems easier for people to mess up student housing. So that's a niche that we can come in and resolve that. The, the other thing is, is there's not as much competition. Um, a lot of people are afraid of student housing. And because of that, that gives us a little bit of a leg up. And in these hot markets where there's so much competition, uh, it's just a niche that 
you know, that we have a little bit of a leg up on. Um, you know, we all know that there's so much competition in, in all the other areas that, you know, we're still looking, we're still looking at market rate rents, um, but student housing seems to be a little easier for us. So do you think people mess it up because uh, of the two things you brought up, um, the property management and it's just the, the value add portion of it? Or? Well, I think the, the key, the key is getting proper property management, right? Um, getting the wrong property management, you know, could, can kill you. Um, even on our Arizona property, we had a property management company in there originally that um, was a huge property management company that specialized in student housing. They had recently sold their company and all their properties. They, under a new name, the... Um, the principals under a new name came in and were starting from scratch. And we thought, wow, this is great. You got the principals that are got this great experience uh, in student housing. Um, this is going to be great. We're going to be one of their, their um, they're just, they were real small at the time. They just had very few and that they would work out and really put a lot of time and attention into our property, which was a small property. Um, that's only uh, a 20, it's 20, um, five bedroom, two bath units. Uh, so a hundred, okay. it's a hundred beds. And we thought that was going to be a great match. Well, that was a mistake because they were in expansion mode and they were spending all of their time trying to expand and get new properties, uh, which they were buying some and then managing some of their own as well as doing some third party management. But even though they said that they would be paying all the attention to us, you know, but we're going to be gone traveling for the next five days. <laughs> right. So, you know, um, so they didn't give us the attention and things slipped and that hurt us pretty badly. Um, and we're still catching up from that. Um, but that's, that was the thing is they had all this experience, but their focus was not on us. And so that was not an appropriate property management company. So it, yes, property management company in market rate or student housing makes or breaks you even more so right. in student housing. Yeah, I believe it. Yeah, even more yeah, that, so in student housing. That's exactly right. You guys were, it sounds like to, to them, you, you know, you, you weren't the focus. You were just small potatoes to them. They were focused mm -hmm. on other stuff. And um, you guys got the short end of the stick, unfortunately. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. And that was, that was eye opening. So did you end up replacing them? Oh yeah. We ended yeah. up replacing them. We love the company that are, that we're dealing with right now, but there's other issues uh, in the area. Okay. Um, one thing that we, we never thought was going to happen was typically if you've got a property, this particular property in Arizona is uh, about two miles from the campus. So we figured, okay, two miles from the campus, you're not going to be the, you're not the prime prime um, student housing. We didn't have any amenities. We said, that's okay. The properties that were close to the, pro the school were going for about 1,200, about 1,200 a bed per, per month. Wow. And okay. we were looking wow. at, okay, we were looking at, uh, we were going to get 450, uh, 500 a bed. So we weren't going to be the high end mm -hmm. um, property. Right. And that was fine. That was, that was how we budgeted. What we didn't plan on is some of these brand new expanded properties close to the campus um, uh, getting built late in the, in the lease up process and deciding to drop, the, drop their rates to unbelievably low rates just to get the occupancy up. Okay, so here are these properties that are probably next year going to be going for maybe twelve to fifteen hundred dollars a bed are now going, you know, four four to five hundred dollars a bed. Wow. So you know, not thinking that those guys are gonna steal our clients, they yeah. are. Now they are yeah. because our clients are gonna say, Hey, I could get a property, I can get a unit right near the campus, brand new property with a pool and a gym and all this stuff. And uh, so for that for this year, 
while these thousand beds that just came online are hurting us, you know, we've got to hang in there and, and hope that no more new ones come on and, and start stealing our thunder. And they're priced that low just to fill it up for now and then eventually raise the price, you think? Absolutely. They're yeah. going to take, they're going, what they're, they're figuring that they're going to take less of a loss. I mean, they're, I'm sure that they're taking a loss Absolutely. on those prices, but they're going to take less of a loss than they would if they tried to get the full price. Right. Yeah. I mean, a hundred percent occupancy at 500 bucks a month is better than, you know, 80% better than or yeah. better than 50%. In right. Total. Right. In a, in a brand new, in a right. brand new. Yeah. Building. So, and they're hoping they figured, okay, maybe some of these people will stick around for next semester. Right. And, and they're then, probably going to give them all kinds of incentives to, to, uh, uh, re release. Mm -hmm. Um, right. but you know, that's, so that's a struggle that we're, that we're dealing with now, but we've okay. got a management company that is doing everything that she can. Um, and, um, you know, we're, we're working through this. Very nice. Cool. So what, what, are, what are some things that you have in the, in the pipeline and that you're looking to do in the future? Well, I don't have anything really in the pipeline. Um, one of the things that I'm focusing on more and it's similar, I, I'm assuming to kind of what you guys are doing. Um, I'm spending more time as a capital raiser. Um, so I'm looking for deals, um, okay. looking for deals all over the place. Uh, you know, I do do some uh, coaching and so some of my students are out looking for deals, bringing deals. Um, I have a deal that I'm looking at right now, which is going to be uh, kind of a high-end flip um, in, in my area in Southern California. I normally don't do anything in Southern California. Um, Probably fairly but, expensive over there, huh? Yeah, but the thing is, is the thing that's nice about it, if you can buy a property that's um, an expensive property and say a three cap, mm -hmm say a three cap and get, you know, increase your rents by, you know, two, $300 a month um, on a three cap. That's a huge amount of money. Yeah. So, yes. so I'm looking to do a little bit of that, you know, maybe just doing some flipping. I got a property that I'm, in fact, when I get off this call, I'm going to be contacting the broker to see nice. where we are um, to possibly be, be doing that. But um I'm in a situation now that uh, I'm in no rush. Um, That's great. This is a market that I certainly don't want to rush into. I'm very conservative, but if I get deals, somebody brings in a deal and convinces me that it's a deal that I like it and I like the market, uh, I'll partner up with them. I'll help them get it closed using my resources, nice. e either with, with equity or um, people to sign on the loans mm -hmm. or, uh, my experience uh, with the lenders, whatever I could do to help get it closed, so I get to cool. I get to do those, you know, play the, play that part in the role rather right. than doing everything. I used to do everything and either with my partners, and um, I'm doing more of the equity raising and the helping to get deals closed. Yeah, you nice. you built the reputation and experience, so you can kind of leverage that on your side. Say, hey, look, I got this. You need to bring something else to the table. Absolutely. So that's awesome. Right. That's awesome. Well, Jeff, we're going to jump into our moments of truth section here. Mm -hmm. It's the same seven questions we ask all of our guests, and we're just going to kick it off with the first one. Who is your success role model? You know, I was thinking about that one, and I don't know. There's a lot of people that, um, you know, I look at, I mean, I look at Joe Fairless, you know, yeah. started out with uh, like a fourplex when he started doing his po daily podcasts. And now he's going towards, uh, you know, a billion dollars in, in um, control. I have no desire to, to get to that point. Yeah. Um, but I have to hand it to him that uh, it's pretty awesome. Yeah, um, incredible. He's a machine. That, that uh, what he's done and his determination. Um, you know, and I know he's a Tony Robbins fan. I am, I am also. So Tony Robbins is very inspirational to me. Cool. Um, so I would have to say that, you know, those – probably are the role models that, that I look towards, but you know, I certainly don't care to be at that level. Yeah. But, yeah, yeah it's, it's, it's not for everybody, but you know, it's, it's pretty inspiring. Like you said, to, to see a guy like Joe Fairless, you know, like yeah, the drive. A relatively young guy. Yeah. yeah. Well, he says he wants to control a billion dollars worth by the time he's 40. And I think he's late thirties. Yeah. yeah. And he, I can see him doing it too. He's, 
Oh, I, I don't, I don't doubt that he'll yep. get there. He's the reason we started a daily podcast. I wasn't, I was like, why don't we, yeah. do we have to do daily? Yeah. And Brandon's well, like, no, Joe Fairless says do daily. <laughs> well, see, that's the other thing is I would venture to guess that the number of podcasts that are out there now, I would say a majority of those are inspired by Joe's success. Mm, I'm sure. Yeah. No. And, and that's, you're looking at one of them. Yes. It, we, <laughs> I, I saw him at an event down in Dallas back in July and one of the questions he was on stage and the, the host asked him a question and said, if you lost everything right now, you know, your, your wealth, your, yeah, all the apartments, all your network, what would you do? And he said, well, I would do the podcast, but I would do it twice a day. So, and, and to me, that showed that he had so much faith in the podcast creating, you know, his wealth and, and his connections that it had that much of an impact on his business. So I, at that point, I realized that, hey, this needs to get done if you want to get to the next level. And, mm -hmm. and that's, that's the, the expert platform. Yeah. And that was something that I've toyed with. Uh, and I decided, you know what? I'm not going to do my own podcast. I'll just make myself available for other people's podcasts. Right. <laughs> and, and, and as we've, we've noticed so far, it, it's a lot of work doing a podcast yeah. it, it, especially doing a daily one, but it, absolutely. I so. can imagine doing that. But, That's right. Uh, so ne next question is uh, what, what's your biggest success? Well, you know, I would, I have to say that, my biggest success is that property that I was talking about in Georgia and not just the financial success. I mean, it's going to be very uh, successful when we do sell it, but I, I told you about um, my doing the videotaping of the interviews of some of the students. And one of the things that was just so touching to me was, or the last question I asked the uh, students, my tenants, um, when I did the interview with them, as I said, if you had the opportunity to talk to the owner, what would you say? Because I, I never let them know that I had anything to do with any mm -hmm. ownership. And I had this, this one, one uh, young girl um, almost in tears going and say that uh, she loves what was done to the property, that now she feels good about bringing her mom and showing her where she lived. That's cool. And awesome. that, that was very touching because this is a low economic area. Right. It's a low economic pro property. These, these kids, most of them are on uh, uh, financial assistance. And she felt safe. She felt good that she could bring her mom in and, and not have her mom feel bad about how disgusting the place looked. Right. And it looked disgusting. We, we would have turned around on the property. The property was horrible. I mean, it was built in 1999. So the outside looked great. Right. But when you came inside, it looked horrible. And it's we a relatively renovated. short time to go in such a decline. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we renovated every wow. floor, every wall, um, with every wall was painted, every floor was recovered. Um, you know, everything was done to it, the stairs, the hallways. That's and great. so she felt comfortable bringing her mom and we also put security doors you know uh, mm -hmm. key fob doors on it updated the cam security cameras and now the people uh, felt safe being there and that was a huge success having that feeling of these people living there being happy to be there and That's cool. and with a waiting list and right. so that that was our biggest you know, I feel that's my biggest success. Yeah, nice. that's, that's huge. Uh, what's a typical day for you look like? Oh, it, it depends. Uh, <laughs> these days I talk to a lot of people. I do a lot of, uh, uh, talking to investors. I go to a lot of, uh, meetups. Uh, I run a couple of my own, but that's my platform as opposed to a podcast. But, I meet a lot of people and then interview them later on uh, to see if they're going to be my investors. Um, but that's typically, I typically don't talk too much with brokers. Sometimes some of the ones I've established relationships with will contact me. And so I may deal with, with them and look at the property and let them know what I think. But I don't aggressively do that. 
but I do go to a lot of different seminars where I meet a lot of people. Um, that's most of it. Um, being, being retired, uh, I get to spend a lot of time with my grandkids. Oh, nice. So, so I do get to go out and uh, either pick my grandkids up from school or go to their soccer games. And that's important. Uh, that's, you know, the, there's, uh, that's what it's all about. Absolutely. Right. Yeah. So I get to spend time with my kids and my grandkids. And um, I just was on a, I did a 25 mile bike ride this morning. Wow. Um, nice. You know, spend a half an hour in the hot tub and then, uh, that's and joined awesome. you guys so sounds like love life so yeah. I'm, I'm enjoying life and as deals come to me uh i will put in the time and effort i need to successfully get a deal done Very but cool. in between i do a lot of socializing and Very meeting cool. love it. what's your favorite quote i get two favorite quotes that i that i put that's on my news uh my email and um one of them is the brian tracy uh, in order to achieve thing that, things that you've never achieved before, you must be willing to do things you've never done before. So I really think That's that good. people have to get out of their shell. They have to get out of their comfort zone. And I talk about that a lot, comfort zone. Um, you don't get, if you don't get out of your comfort zone, you're not going to grow. Mm, right. uh, every time you get out of your comfort zone, you, you, know, you grow, you push yourself, you develop. And so I think that's a great quote. The other one is one I think I really live by, and it's and that's a Zig Ziglar one. You know, if you want to achieve your goals, help others achieve theirs. Mm -hmm. um, so I've been running a couple of clubs. For one of the clubs I've been running since about 2005. Uh, the other one, it's probably better about four or five years. And I go to these meetings and I help new people. I give them advice. I you know, just talk to them about different things. I bring people together and I'm excited when they have successes, even if I'm not even involved with it. If two people met at my club and, and partnered up and did a flip together or bought something together, I'm happy about that. And it's amazing how many times things come back to me that all of a sudden someone says, Hey, tell me about your next deal. You know, yeah. I want, I want to invest with you. Same with doing these podcasts. I get on these podcasts. Um, I will give people any advice that I may have, any wisdom I may have. And next thing I know is someone will call me up and say, Hey, I heard you on that podcast or I hear, I saw you on, uh, I heard what you wrote on bigger pockets and I liked what you had to say, you know, tell me about your business and how I can get involved. Yeah. So, nice. you know, that's what it's you, all you about. Pay it, you, you pay it forward and who knows what's going to happen. That's right. Very true. What are some of your hobbies? Um, I like to bike ride. That's probably my biggest hobby. I also like to ski. I haven't been doing uh, as, as much of that uh, lately, but um, I guess the bike riding is probably the, the biggest one. And I mean, that's my main form of exercise. Mm-hmm. And then, cool. uh, you know, spending time with my grandkids. Love so it. is it 25 mile bike rides every day or? Is um, that... I try to get a hundred miles a week in. Wow. Um, That's a lot. so sometimes I'll get 30 in, um, lately I, I had a little illness a couple of weeks back, so I've been building back up, but 25 to 30, uh, somewhere around 30 miles on a ride. Um, uh, depends if I have time in the mornings. But cool. uh, I try to get 100 miles a weekend. That's awesome. Love it. What's the best business book that you've read? Um, you know, I mean, we all started out with Rich Dad Poor Dad, I think. Um, mm -hmm. But the, I think the E Myth is is a great book uh, as far as getting systems, uh, systematizing things. Um, I've, that's probably one of my favorite um, that I go back to a lot. Is the okay. E Myth. Yeah, yeah it's I think on my, it's on my a, list. Yeah, another one that brought that up too. But last question here, Jeff. If there's one key piece of advice you could leave our listeners with about achieving success, what do you think it would be? Uh, real estate is not a get rich quick uh, for most people. That it may be a get rich, but it, it's going to take time. It's going to take energy. It's going to take uh, stamina. There's so many times that I've looked back and I said, why didn't I turn around? Why didn't I go back? Um, so it's just persistence. 
that those that um, continue and push themselves and have a good why, have a good reason to continue mm. are the ones that are going to succeed. And I think most people that I've, that I talk to that are successful will agree to that, that there's been many, many, many times that it would have been so much easier just to quit and yeah. they didn't. So I think persistence is, is the greatest gift that you can have. Yeah. That's, that's awesome great. advice. So Jeff, how can our listeners get in contact with you? Like you said, if, if they hear you on the show or, or, or see some of your posts somewhere, how can they get in contact? Yeah, you're with you? coaching. You said you'd do some coaching as well. So yeah, you can get a hold of me at, at Jeff at synergetic ig.com and that's spelled S Y N E R G E T I C I G.com or my website, which is the same, um, synergeticig.com. Um, also on Bigger Pockets, um, I communicate with people. I haven't been on the forums as much lately, which I keep telling myself I need to get in there. But um, I do respond to people that send me things from Bigger Pockets as well. Awesome. That's yeah. great. And if, if the, for the listeners are not aware of bigger pockets, you need to check it out. There's a lot of yep. awesome free information in there. There's also paid information on there, but uh, if Jeff's on there, then you're in the right place. So that's right. But Jeff, we appreciate you being on the show today and, and giving our listeners a good information about student housing and, and some of the multifamily assets that you have. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you guys very much to, for having me and uh, I'd love to hear from some of your listeners. Yeah, yep. absolutely. And for our listeners, feel free to contact Jeff. If you got any questions, interested in, in partnering with, with him and also don't forget to subscribe to the show so that you're not missing any of our daily episodes and join us on Facebook at facebook.com slash groups slash wealth junkies. Again, Jeff, we appreciate you being on. Thank you all very much. Yep. yep. Thanks Jeff. I See everybody this. tomorrow.